envy, lust, betrayal, murder. And that's inside the Vatican. Whether you want to pin the evils of man on Satan himself or just plain old human nature, there's no denying men have a penchant for trouble. But we are about to tackle something much bigger, something that could impact every person on this planet, the battle for our very souls. Welcome to The In-Between. I'm Caroline, and today we investigate a 100-year-old miracle that leads us to a mystery 100 years in the making, the mystery of Fatima. Some of you may already know the story of the miracle at Fatima, and some of you may not, but no matter what you think of the miracle part, just hang on. Because as soon as you think the story is over, that's when it takes a sharp left into places even fiction writers are afraid to go. At the dawn of the 20th century, Portugal is a mess. After overthrowing their 800-year-old monarchy in 1910, they flounder for a while. And when I say flounder, I mean 45 different governments in 16 years. That's a new government every three months. What they end up with is a government that hates the Catholic Church and passes laws specifically meant to drive the church out of Portugal. All of that history is to paint you a backdrop for the events that transpire in May of 1917 that will go on to change the Catholic Church forever. Our tale starts in the summer of 1916. Three children, Lucia dos Santos, who's nine years old, and her two cousins, Jacinta, who's six, and Francisco, who's eight, are out in the fields tending sheep starts to rain a bit, so the children seek shelter in a small cave, eat their lunch, pray the rosary, and then just hang out for a bit playing jacks. When a huge wind starts to blow so hard, it's shaking the trees. The kids look up from their game, wondering what kind of storm is whipping up, and see a light above the trees, whiter than snow, moving towards them. As the light moves closer, the form of a man starts to take shape. The man says to the stunned children, Fear not. I am the angel of peace. Pray with me. After praying with the children, the angel tells them, The hearts of Jesus and Mary are attentive to the voice of your supplications. At which point, he takes his leave. The children are speechless. And after praying for a little longer, they go home and tell some of their friends, but they get such grief in return, they stop telling anybody. It takes a while, but they eventually return to being normal little kids with one exception. They are now inseparable. The angel of peace would visit them three more times that summer, each time leaving the children excited, but drained of their strength at the same time. But it also transforms the idea of God's love into something they could literally feel. They go from typical six, eight, and nine-year-olds to children of outstanding devotion to God. Fast forward to the next summer, specifically May 13th, 1917. The children are out in the fields once again in an area called the Cova de Aria, having a great time building a castle out of rocks on a spectacularly beautiful clear day when a bright shaft of light flashes in front of them, so bright that they thought it was lightning. So even though there's not a cloud in the bright blue sky, they gather up the sheep and start heading home thinking a storm has to be coming. As they're heading down the hill, another flash of light stops them and they see the most beautiful woman they have ever seen, dressed all in white, more brilliant than the sun, hovering over a home elk tree. Fear not, I will not harm you. Where are you from? I am from heaven. What do you want of me? I come to ask you to come here for six consecutive months on the 13th day at the same hour. I will tell you later who I am, and what I want. And I? Am I too going to heaven? Yes, you shall. And Jacinta? Yes. And Francisco? 
He too shall go, but he must say many rosaries. Then the lady asked the children, Do you want to offer yourselves to God to endure all the sufferings that he may choose to send you as an act of reparation for the sins by which he is offended and as supplication for the conversion of sinners? Promptly, Lucia responds for all three, Yes, we want to. Then you are going to suffer a great deal, but the grace of God will be your comfort. After telling the children to pray the rosary, the lady in white rises back up into the sky. The children spend the rest of the afternoon talking about the stunning apparition. Interestingly enough, Lucia and Jacinta can hear and see the lady, but Francisco can only see her and has to ask the girls what she said. They also notice that after the visits from the Angel of Peace, they were always exhausted. But this time, they feel full of energy and joy. When they finally head home for the day, they all agree not to tell anyone. They'd already learned that lesson from the grief they got from telling people about seeing the Angel of Peace. But poor little Jacinta just can't resist, and she tells her mom about everything that happened to them. Her mom just can't resist telling the neighbors about her own children being blessed enough to be visited by none other than Our Lady herself. And word spreads. When it gets back to Lucia's mother, she's furious at the thought that one of her children is a liar and tells Lucia that she's really in for it if she does not recant her story and tell the truth. So the next day, Lucia is sad because her own mother thinks she's a liar, and Lily Jacinta is sad because she broke her promise of silence to Lucia. Seems like Our Lady's warning that the children will suffer is already coming true. But life goes on for another month. June 13th rolls around, and while the rest of the village goes to church to celebrate the Feast of St. Anthony, Lucia, Jacinta, and Francisco, and about 50 other people from nearby villages, because word is already getting out, head out to the Cova de Aria to see Our Lady in White. And the Lady in White does not disappoint. Around noon, right on schedule, the lady appears to the children. I would like to ask you to take us to heaven. Yes, I will take Jacinta and Francisco soon. You, however, are to stay here a longer time. Am I going to stay here alone? Lucia asks, full of sadness at the thought of losing her beloved cousins. No, my daughter, I will never leave you. The other people who had come to see the lady in white can hear Lucia speaking to her, but all they hear in return is something that sounds like a very gentle voice, like the gentle humming of a bee, but they can't understand what is being said. The lady reminds the children to pray the rosary and then leaves. Witnesses report that when the lady leaves, they only see a small wispy cloud rising toward the east and a hissing sound like a distant rocket. The children spend the next month being constantly harassed. Lucia's entire family still thinks she's lying. It gets so bad that Lucia has been convinced by all the naysayers that she isn't seeing the Immaculate Mary. She is entertaining the devil, which makes her decide not to go again. However, when she wakes up on the morning of July 13th, her heart is changed and all three children head out for the Cova de Aria together. This time they are joined by their mothers, who follow them in secret just to make sure they don't get hurt in the crowd. And Jacinta and Francisco's father, T, who believes every word because he knows these children are not liars. The lady in white comes again right on time and appears to the children. T, who is led through the crowd of 5,000 people by his fellow villagers so he can stand next to his children, says... I began to hear a hum like a fly within an empty jug, but I did not hear a word. This is when the lady in white tells the children a secret in three parts now known as the three secrets. The first secret is a glimpse of hell.
Plunged in this fire were demons and souls of the damned in human form, like transparent burning embers, all blackened and burnished bronze, floating about in the conflagration, now raised into the air by the flames that issued from within themselves together with great clouds of smoke, now falling back on every side like sparks in huge fires, without weight or equilibrium, amid shrieks and groans of pains and despair, which horrified us and made us tremble with fear. The second secret has to do with saving sinners with the establishment of a devotion to her Immaculate Heart. She tells them the war will be ending soon, but if people do not stop sinning, a worse one is going to break out in the reign of Pius XI. She tells Lucia that when you see the night sky illuminated by an unknown light, know that it is a sign from God that the next war is coming. And I'll be back to ask for the consecration of Russia. If sinners do what I ask and pray the rosary in my name, Russia will be converted and there will be peace. She also tells them that in Portugal, the dogma of the faith will always be preserved. Then she tells Lucia not to tell this to anyone except Francisco. Lucia, thinking of her mother and the priest and everyone else who doesn't believe her, asks the lady, Will you please tell us who you are and perform a miracle so that everyone will believe that you appear to us? The lady replies, Continue to come here every month. In October, I will say who I am and what I desire, and I will perform a miracle all shall see, so that they believe. The crowd then hears a crack of thunder and sees a lantern stand shake as if in an earthquake as the telltale little gray cloud above the tree disappears to the east. And with that, Mary is gone once again. Now, as you might imagine, after a third visit, word is spreading far and wide. But that's a problem. Remember our history lesson at the beginning? That the government of Portugal hates the Catholics and sees them all as just filth to be gotten rid of. While the chief magistrate of the county that Fatima is located in is Artur Oliveria Santos, your typical party line hack. So as more and more people stream into the area in hopes of seeing the apparition, or at least seeing the children, Santos thinks, not on my watch, and summons the children to extract a confession. The children seemingly have nothing to confess, so he releases them. However, on the morning of August 13th, he brings his carriage around to the houses of the children and tells them, get in, I'll give you a ride. Once the kids are in the carriage, he covers them in a carpet and whisks them away to jail, where they sit for three days. Santos even goes so far as to tell the kids that he has a vat of boiling oil for them if they don't confess. The children stand firm. So he leads away Jacinta and puts her someplace else, telling Lucia and Francisco that she's dead. That doesn't work. So he leads away Francisco, telling Lucia he's dead too. Lucia says nothing, even though she completely believes that her two cousins are now dead, having been boiled in oil. Santos finally figures out that his bluff didn't work and lets the three kids go. The kids are really sad, though, because they missed being at the Cova de Aria on the 13th when the lady in white told them to be there. Interestingly enough, even though the children aren't at the Cova de Aria, the crowd of 15,000 people are not disappointed. The crack of thunder comes along with the usual flash, and immediately they notice a little white cloud that hovers over the home oak. It stays a few minutes, then rises toward the heavens where it disappears. Looking around, they notice everyone's face is glowing rose and red and blue and all the colors of the rainbow. The ground is made of little squares of different colors. Even their clothes are transformed into every color of the rainbow. The trees are covered with flowers. Every leaf is a flower. 
And evidently, Mother Mary has mercy on the children since not being there on the 13th isn't their fault. So the next Sunday, August 19th, she appears to them in another place called Valenos. And again, she tells them to keep coming to Cova di Aria on the 13th, keep praying the rosary, and she will prove to the world that the children aren't lying. This is music to Lucia's ears, because this whole time, her entire family still thinks she's lying. Her mother punishes her, and her siblings mock her relentlessly, trying to get her to reveal the secret Our Lady has given her. But little Lucia, though sad refuses to betray Our Lady's confidence. The children become more and more pious as the weeks of summer pass by, giving up their lunches and even refusing to drink during the hot summer days, all in an effort to increase their own suffering to help the souls of those who need a little help, either earthly or otherworldly. September 13th arrives and the children have a really hard time getting through the 30 thousand people who have lined the entire distance from their homes to Cova di Aria, many of them climbing walls and trees in desperate bids to get their attention to ask them to intercede on their behalf with Our Lady. When they finally make it to the home oak tree and it's time for the Lady to appear, the familiar signs of her approach begin. The cooling of the air, the dimming of the sun, the crack of thunder. This time, the crowd can see a globe of light coming from the east and settling over the oak tree. Lucia asks the lady, as she does each time, what she can do for the lady in white, and does her best to relay as many messages from the pilgrims as she can. As the lady in white takes her leave, the crowd once again sees the luminous globe ascending into the sky. And this time, they are treated to a shower of iridescent flower petals that vanish when they hit the ground. The next four weeks are torture for everyone involved. Believers constantly come calling to the homes of both families, hoping to visit with the children, begging them to deliver their appeals for mercy to the lady. And dealing with the crowds of believers is hard enough, but the unbelievers make things even worse. Neighbors threaten bodily harm to the families if the big miracle doesn't happen on October 13th, as the children say it will. The local magistrates and newspapers are giddy with excitement and can't wait for the big day to arrive. To them, when nothing happens, as they are sure it won't, they get to report it as the big hoax they predicted it to be and the perfect opportunity to trash the church that they all hate so much. As October 13th gets closer, Lucia's house is coming unglued. Her mother begs her to go to confession and tell the priest that it's all a big lie, afraid of the threats of violence if the lady does not provide a miracle for all to see. Francisco and Jacinta have it better than Lucia. Their dad, T, is a staunch believer and does his best to shield his children. But even with that added protection, Priests from neighboring villages stalk the kids, trying to get them to confess the lie. But nothing works. The morning of October 13th, a rain that started the day before continues making mud of the roads and the fields. But that does not stop the estimated 70,000 people who had been pouring into the area for days. Some estimates go as high as 100,000. The poor little oak tree is now only a trunk since so many people wanted a leaf or a branch as a souvenir that they stripped the poor little thing bare. But it was now decorated in colorful ribbons and flowers, soaking wet and hanging in the increasing downpour. Getting through the mud and the crowds takes a bit of doing, but Lucia, Francisco, and Jacinta finally take their place in front of what's left of the oak tree. A priest approaches the children to ask what time the lady comes. She comes at noon. Everyone is silent as noon comes and goes. Minutes pass. The priest starts yelling to anyone who can hear him that it's past noon Everyone, get out of here. The whole thing is an illusion. 
Lucia stands her ground and sees the lady approaching from the east. The priest goes silent. The miracle has begun. Incidentally, Lucia never saw that priest again. The lady in white tells the children she is Our Lady of the Rosary and that she wants a chapel built in that place in her honor. As she starts to rise in a flood of light, she points to the sun, which seems to immediately brighten as the clouds disappear and the sky clears and Our Lady of the Rosary stops in the sky to the right of the sun. To the left of the sun appears St. Joseph holding the baby Jesus, who both make the sign of the cross three times over the world. But unlike the others, Lucia can even see the Lord dressed in red as the divine Redeemer, blessing the world. And as the children are enraptured by this heavenly spectacle that only they can see, everyone else is watching the sky for other reasons. The sun, still at its full brightness, becomes possible to look at without hurting your eyes while continuously fading and glowing. Its rays spread everywhere, painting everything they touch in different colors as if they're shining through a stained glass window. Everything, the ground, people's faces, the trees, even the air itself. It stops its light show and starts bouncing around in the sky stops, bounces some more before it starts hurtling itself toward the earth on a zigzag course like it's just falling out of the sky. People start screaming and crying, thinking this is the literal end of the world. But as quickly as it started, the sun returns to its place in the sky. A wave of relief sweeps through the crowd. This whole light show takes about 10 minutes. And when the sun is still again, everyone is a little surprised to discover that their clothes, which had been dripping wet from standing in the rain for hours, are now completely dry, as is the mud on the ground. And these things are seen by both believers and non-believers. In fact, being a believer was not even a guarantee. Some believers saw nothing, while some non-believers saw everything. But those who did see number into the tens of thousands, with many people saying things like, From those thousands of mouths, I heard shouts of joy and love to the Most Holy Virgin. And then I believed. I had the certainty of not having been the victim of a suggestion. I had seen the sun as I would never see it again. After what has become known as the miracle of the sun, the children try really hard to get back to their lives, but the multitudes of people showing up at their doors, wanting the children to repeat the words of Our Lady over and over, make that impossible. Francisco and Jacinta spend every available moment in prayer because Our Lady told them she would be coming to take them to heaven soon. Sure enough, the Spanish flu hits Fatima in October of 1918. Everyone in Francisco and Jacinta's family gets sick except for their dad, T, who is left to care for the entire household. Our Lady appears to Francisco and Jacinta again to let them know she will be back for them soon. The children are elated. The flu hits Lucia's house too, and almost everyone in her house gets sick. But Lucia does not. And when she's not tending for her own family, she goes to visit Francisco and Jacinta as often as she can because she knows they will be in heaven soon. Francisco passes away on April 4th, 1919, and Jacinta on February 20th, 1920. Lucia is now on her own. Of course, she's not really on her own. She and her family are still living with the endless stream of visitors wanting to see Lucia. Not long after the miracle of the sun, the Vatican reestablishes the diocese in Liria, Portugal, of which Fatima is a part. The new bishop, Reverend Josef Correria de Silva, puts documenting the whole story of everything that happened at Fatima at the top of his priority list. 
seeing the undue burden all of the attention is placing on Lucia's family and the town of Fatima itself, he offers to send Lucia away to a convent school where no one would know her real name and no one would bother her. And just like that, Lucia is spirited away in the middle of the night to a new home where she can go to school and worship in peace. When she finishes school, Lucia asks to enter the Order of the Sisters of St. Dorothy, the people who have taken such good care of her. Lucia also receives a few more visits from Our Lady and the Child Jesus over the next few years, asking her to spread their message that, in short, people better start praying the rosary. In 1927, Lucia receives permission from Mary to reveal the first two parts of the secret, the vision of hell and the call for devotion to the Immaculate Heart of Mary to avoid World War II. But Lucia still carries the third part of the secret all on her own. In 1929, Mary pays another visit to Lucia and says, Remember back in 1917 when I said I would be calling for the consecration of Russia? Well, it's time. I am here to call for the consecration of Russia. Her instructions are that all of the bishops in the world in union with the Pope must consecrate Russia to her immaculate heart. If that is done, the world shall know a lasting peace. In 1931, Lucia gets another visit, basically asking, why haven't you consecrated Russia yet? Interestingly enough, remember Mary's original message from 1917? It basically says, if they do not stop offending God, another and worse war will break out in the reign of Pius XI. And that when you see the night sky illuminated by an unknown light, know that it is a sign from God that the next war is coming. Well, that's kind of specific. Did any of that actually happen? Yes, it did. On January 25th and 26th, 1938, a geomagnetic storm, also called the Fatima Storm, lit up the entire night sky with an aurora borealis light storm seen all across the world. And Pope Pius XI reigned from February 6th, 1922 until February 10th, 1939. But the war didn't start until September 1939, right? True, but all the precursors leading up to it and making it inevitable certainly did. And so, as World War II starts raging, Pope Pius XI's successor, Pope Pius XII, says, maybe we should do this consecration thing. So in 1942, he consecrates the whole of humanity, which would naturally include Russia, to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. Close, but not quite. Then in 1952, he consecrates the people of Russia to the Immaculate Heart, but not in communion with bishops worldwide. Also close, but not quite. In 1964, Pope Paul VI also consecrates humanity, which would include Russia, to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. In 1981 and 1982, Pope John Paul II also consecrates the whole human race to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. But none of those consecrations are done in communion and coordination with the rest of the Catholic bishops of the world. In 1983, Pope John Paul II sets out to get it right this time. And on December 8th, 1983, he sends a letter to all the bishops worldwide, Catholic and Orthodox, asking them to join in on March 25th, 1984, for an act of entrustment to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. He even consults with Sister Lucia to make sure this consecration of Russia would be valid. But when the big day arrives, he's got all the bishops, but does not specifically mention Russia in the actual consecration. But even though we all know by now that that's not the way it's supposed to happen, Sister Lucia comes out and says, yep, that's the right one. Now, why would she say that after decades of telling the popes, you're doing it wrong. The instructions from Mary are pretty self-explanatory. So why cave now? To figure that out, 
we need to look at what's been up with Sister Lucia over the last 50 years. I hope you guys are hungry because we are about to open a can of worms and scoop out a healthy plateful. Remember in 1927, when Sister Lucia got permission from Mary to reveal the first two parts of the secret? Well, it takes her a little while to get going, but between 1935 and 1941, she writes four memoirs, the last of which contains the messages from the first two secrets, the vision of hell and that we need to pray the rosary and consecrate Russia to avoid World War II. She then gets really sick, and in October of 1943, the Bishop of Fatima tells her she'd better write down the third secret just in case. Of course, as a nun, she is compelled to obey orders from her superiors. Sister Lucy tries to obey, but she just can't bring herself to write it down. In 1944, Our Lady appears to Sister Lucy and says, not only is it okay to write it down, but I want it to be revealed to the world no later than 1960. So Sister Lucia writes it down, puts it in a sealed envelope, delivers it personally to her confessor, who in turn delivers it to the Bishop of Fatima, Joseph de Silva, on June 17, 1944. Bishop de Silva puts the envelope into another envelope and hangs on to it, even posing for a picture with it that appears in Life magazine in 1949. In 1957, Pope Pius XII decides maybe the envelope is safer with him at the Vatican. When it's delivered, Bishop John Venancio holds it up to a strong light that can see through both envelopes and sees the letter containing the third secret. He carefully notes that the secret is about 25 lines long. The envelope is then placed in a safe in the papal apartments. So now everyone in the world is just waiting for 1960 to roll around so they can find out what it says. August 17th, 1959, Pope John the 23rd reads the 25-line text of the third secret and writes on the envelope, I leave it to others to comment or decide. Then in 1960, he makes another statement, this time saying, this matter is not for our times. And on February 8th, the Vatican issues an anonymous press release stating that the third secret would not be disclosed and would probably remain forever under absolute seal. What? It is also noted that in that year, Pope John XXIII reads the 62-line text of the third secret. Wait, how did we pick up an extra 37 lines? The Vatican then brings down the hammer and imposes some really strict conditions of isolation on Sister Lucia. The very same year that the third secret is to be revealed to the world and isn't. Keep in mind that Lucy is already pretty much in isolation as a cloistered nun, but she still has a few things to say. In 1957, in what would become her last public interview that was not pre-approved by the Vatican, Sister Lucy says, The devil is about to wage a decisive battle with the Blessed Virgin. Take note of that word about. That seems to indicate that the decisive battle hasn't started yet. And while she never reveals the exact contents of the third secret, Sister Lucia lets loose on a few occasions talking about the diabolic disorientation infecting the upper hierarchy. Bet that made a few pontiffs angry. But after 1960, up until the time of her death in 2005, Sister Lucy is forbidden to speak about Fatima without direct permission from the Vatican. So some might say that the Vatican is purposefully burying Sister Lucy. But why? What else is going on in the rest of the world? I'll tell you what. Vatican II. The Vatican had just gotten a new pope in October of 1958. John the 23rd, who then, just three months later, gives notice of his intention to convene the Second Ecumenical Council of the Vatican, more commonly known as Vatican II. Why? Well, 
He felt that the church needed updating to better connect with people in an increasingly secularized world. Translation, the church needed to get more hip. But as you might expect, there are a bunch of members of the church, clergy and laymen alike, who all said, are you nuts? That's heresy. So the battle lines are drawn. Pope John XXIII opens Vatican II in October of 1962, but then dies in the summer of 1963. Pope Paul VI is then elected, but he's all in too, so Vatican II just keeps on going. And Sister Lucia has said enough about the contents of the Third Secret for people to know that it might just be talking about evil infecting the top ranks of the church. So is that why they needed her to be quiet? so they could push through their agenda of fundamental changes to the whole of the Catholic Church? Maybe. But at this point, all of this palace intrigue is pure speculation. Until a curious thing happens. Sister Lucia is not seen in public again until May 13th, 1967, on the 50th anniversary of Fatima, where she appears with Pope Paul VI. It is reported that Sister Lucy asks him to release the third secret, but he refuses. Here is where things get really interesting. Some very observant people took a really close look at the photographs of that meeting and found some really interesting details. The 1967 Sister Lucia does not look like the original Sister Lucia, and these facial differences cannot be attributed to age. Photos were sent to facial analysts, plastic surgeons, oral surgeons, odontologists, and a Guinness Book of World Records holder, facial reconstruction artist. She holds the record for the most cases solved from her facial reconstructions. Their conclusions? Not the same person. They don't even look like the same person. The distance between the eyes is different. The distance from the nose to the mouth is different. The chins are really different. But then investigators went a step further and analyzed known handwriting samples from both Lucy's. Conclusion? You guessed it. Not the same person. <laughs> but wait, there's more. The photos of Sister Lucia and Pope Paul VI are fakes too. Here's the picture that was published of their meeting together on the Fatima anniversary. Now look at these two originals. They spliced together two pictures to make it look like they were together. That's interesting. There are more details on the differences between the Lucys that I haven't gone deep on. So if you want to go down this rabbit hole on your own, go to sisterlucytruth.org. I will put a link in the description. So what does all of this mean? Well, if you remember our discussion earlier about the list of botched consecrations of Russia, Sister Lucia was pretty vocal in letting the Vatican know when they had not done it correctly until the consecration of 1984, when she comes out and says, you finally did it right. Even when we know from her own written instructions from Mother Mary that they didn't do it right. Now, what I find really interesting at this point is that supposedly Sister Lucia has already said, you guys nailed it. But the consecration attempts continue. Well, why? Why would you go through all of that if you have already fulfilled your duty per Mother Mary? Now, just because Sister Lucia is forbidden to talk to the public about the visions at Fatima doesn't mean that we don't hear anything from her. We have letters that she wrote to various people in her life where she had some pretty strong words about the leadership in the church following Vatican II. In 1970, she wrote, It is painful to see such a great disorientation in so many who occupy places of responsibility. The devil has succeeded in infiltrating evil under cover of good, and the blind are beginning to guide others, as the Lord tells us in his gospel, and souls are letting themselves be deceived. Remember that in 1957, Sister Lucy said the devil was about to wage a decisive battle. By 1971, she says the devil has begun to succeed. 
But then the question is, which Lucy is writing these letters? The letters are still very critical of the papacy, which has yet to release the third secret, even though they've been commanded to by Mother Mary herself. In 1978, Pope John Paul II takes the wheel, reads the secret, and also decides he's not jumping on that third rail. Discussions about the third secret never stop, and in November of 1984, Cardinal Ratzinger reveals that he has read the third secret. If that name sounds familiar to you, that's because Cardinal Joseph Aloysius Ratzinger would go on to become Pope Benedict XVI in 2005. According to him, the secret refers to dangers threatening the faith and life of the Christian and therefore the life of the world and the importance of the Novocimi, the last times, the absolute importance of history and that the things contained in this third secret correspond to what has been announced in scripture and has been seen again and again in many other Marian apparitions, first of all, that of Fatima. Now, all of that is important because on June 26, 2000, a press conference is called by the Vatican and Archbishop Bertoni publishes the 62-line text, which he claims is the entire third secret. The text describes a vision in which the Pope, or a bishop dressed in white, is killed by a band of soldiers. And it is the Vatican's position that the text is referring to the 1981 assassination attempt on John Paul II. Therefore, the third secret is already in the past. Nothing to see here, folks. But this text sounds nothing like what is described by Cardinal Ratzinger in his 1984 interview. Little side note on Pope John Paul's brush with the assassin. The attempt to kill him came on May 13th, 1981, the anniversary of the first of the Fatima apparitions. Pope John Paul was so convinced that he was saved only by the grace of Our Lady of Fatima that he travels there exactly one year later to the day of the assassination attempt and places one of the bullets taken from his body into the crown of the statue of Mary in the sanctuary of Fatima. Back to the third secret. So what the Vatican releases sounds nothing like what different people have said about what they know of the third secret to this point. Sister Lucia herself has told us that part of the text contains the phrase, in Portugal, the dogma of the faith will always be preserved, which kind of leads you to believe that there is a but in there somewhere, but none of the 65 lines of text that the Vatican releases makes sense as going with that initial statement. And how exactly did we get from 25 to 62 lines? Since it's a matter of record that in 1957, the letter directly from Sister Lucia was 25 lines. I can't find an answer to that anywhere. But that is certainly part of why there is a growing number of people who believe that the text published in 2000 is not the whole secret. And that it's not about a vision of bishops in white being killed by soldiers. In 1995, Cardinal Mario Luigi Siapi, the personal theologian of five popes, says, In the third secret, it is foretold, among other things, that the great apostasy in the church will begin at the top. The next few years contain a whole lot of catfighting between officials at the Vatican and people who say the Vatican is withholding the whole truth. In the midst of this papal chaos, Sister Lucia dies at the convent of Santa Teresa in Coimbra, Portugal in 2005 at the age of 98. But the controversy does not die with her. In May of 2010, Pope Benedict XVI, who takes over for John Paul II when he passes away in 2005, on his pilgrimage to Portugal, shocks the press and the world, especially the Catholics, by saying that the third secret of Fatima tells us that 
Not only from the outside come the attacks against the Pope and the Church, but the sufferings of the Church come from right inside the Church, from the sin that resides inside the Church. And then just two days later, in front of 500,000 pilgrims, he announces, whoever thinks the prophetic mission of Fatima is concluded, deceives himself. So now what? Well, It appears as though the papacy is not done trying to make things right. On March 15th, 2022, Pope Francis sends out a letter to all the bishops, letting them know that another consecration of Russia is taking place on March 25th, the same day that John Paul performed his consecration in 1984. The consecration happens exactly as scheduled, with Pope Francis reciting the prayer... Mother of God and our Mother, to your Immaculate Heart we solemnly entrust and consecrate ourselves, the Church, and all humanity, especially Russia and Ukraine. Think it'll work this time? I guess only time will tell. And for those of you who think the Vatican is the bad guy and has some splaining to do, take heart that there are those within the Vatican walls working for the same thing. A high-ranking Archbishop, Pietro Sambi, attaché to the Vatican Secretary of State, tells one of his friends that he needs to read this book called The Secret Still Hidden, which alleges a cover-up by the Vatican of a second companion text to the one released in 2000. When his friend expresses his surprise at Archbishop Sambi recommending a book critical of his own office, Sambi says, in the end, we are all after the truth, aren't we? The truth is the important thing. Holy sh- Cow. I meant cow. What would I do with myself if I didn't cover topics that bite off more than I can chew? So as usual, there are links in the description to places you can go for more information if you want to dig deeper. If you enjoy getting stuck in the bottoms of rabbit holes, click on this video right here. Be careful out there, and I will see you here again on The In-Between.